You're listening to TBR Radio Presents the Dixie Heritage Hour with your host, the director of Dixie Heritage, Dr. Ed DeVries. General Robert E. Lee made the comment for which he has been so often quoted that it is a good thing that war is so horrible, lest we should grow too fond of it. And this September-October issue of the Barnes Review magazine is definitely a reminder of how horrible war is and what happens when those who are too fond of war are responsible for the execution of it. I believe one of the reasons why uh, the total warfare of the, of the North against the South was because the Northern generals enjoyed war a little too much. At the same time, I believe that the reason why that same total warfare policy was not returned by the Southerners against the Northerners was because the Southern generals, unlike the Northern generals, did not enjoy war in that same capacity. Hence, General Lee's statement, it's a good thing that war is so horrible lest we grow so fond of it. And so today I'm going to interview Paul Angel, and Paul Angel is my boss at the Barnes Review magazine. He's the editor-in-chief of the Barnes Review. Of course, the regular listeners to TBR Radio presents the Dixie Heritage Hour know that the TBR and TBR Radio is the Barnes Review. You also know that every time a new issue of the Barnes Review magazine comes out, there are bi-monthly issues, uh, six a year come out, and so every time a new issue is coming out, you know, of course, that Paul is our guest here on the show and we talk about the new issue of the magazine. And so that's what we're going to do today. And this issue is dedicated to Holocaust, the Holocaust of uh, Jews during World War II, and also the other Holocausts of history that occurred as well. There was a Bolshevik Holocaust of 60 million people that took place during and after uh, World War II. There was the Soviet starvation Holocaust in the Ukraine, there was the World War II nuclear holocaust of Japan. There was the firebombing holocaust of Japanese civilians during the course of the war. Also the firebombing holocaust of German civilians during the war. And the holocaust of three million German POWs by the Allies after the war. Not to mention the holocaust of World War I. The, there was the Holocaust of the American Indians on this continent to go back in history a century or so. After that, there was the Holocaust of Southerners by Abraham Lincoln. Just the inhumanity of man slaughtering man is a theme that sadly repeats itself throughout the history of humanity. And so that's what we're going to talk about in this interview with Paul Angel. When we think of a Holocaust, we've been programmed to think of the Holocaust of Jews during World War II by the Nazis. But, you know, as this issue kind of shows us that there were multitudes of Holocausts throughout history, especially even throughout recent history, say the last 150 years, and that most of those Holocausts make the World War II Jewish Holocaust, not that we want to lighten it, but, but 6 million compared to 60 million uh, in the Bolshevik Holocaust or however many millions were destroyed during the, the Holocaust of the Japanese during World War II, or even Lincoln's Holocaust on the South. You know, the number six million kind of pales in comparison to some of some of those other numbers. And so what was the inspiration to, uh, to basically dedicate this entire issue that I know was originally going in a different direction to uh, recalling the history of Holocausts around the world? I take myself uh, as an instance but our editor and, and Willis Cardo for the founder and people that have worked for us, they have particular areas of interest and expertise. My area of expertise is not necessarily history. John Tiffany's is botany and biology. Willis was very interested in nationalist movements. Matt Johnson, for instance, was an editor for a while, as an expert on, on socioeconomic uh, factors in development of cultures and nationalism as the movements from one to the next. Yet, to our critics, because we discuss uh, the possibility that some of the facts are wrong about the World War II holocausts, uh, or some World War II holocausts have been completely ignored, 
uh, it doesn't really matter to our critics. We're all just Holocaust deniers. I myself, as I think I've told you, but mostly interested in, or particularly interested in, the possibility of pre-Columbian contact before the, obviously, before the arrival of Columbus, um, and what influence it may have had on the cultures that were here, and whether there's any evidence for it. I don't know whether I'm right or wrong, but that's not what they say. They say we are all Holocaust deniers. I don't think any of the people I've mentioned, nor any of the people that have worked at the Barnes Review over the years, their main focus or interest in their historical research was the Holocaust. Yet, once again, they're all just grouped together. Could be a guy who's only interested in the, poor, the Civil War. Look at poor Clint Lacey. <laughs> Clint, who writes mostly about Civil War Missouri in, in particular, but also interested in Billy the Kid and this type of thing, is being called a Holocaust denier just because he writes stories about the Civil War for the Barnes Review. It's ridiculous. So to try to prove to people that we're not Holocaust deniers, <clears throat> we thought we'd introduce and discuss some of the other Holocausts in history and or even how some of these Holocausts have influenced some of the more uh, important uh, and controversial people in the 20th century, Adolf Hitler, for instance. I mean, I would consider World War I a Holocaust when he was serving in World War, this World War I Holocaust. In which I would imagine, I don't know how many, Ed, maybe you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 million people perished. What did that, how did that Holocaust affect? You know, some people are going to bristle. Uh, we talk about the what I consider an American Indian Holocaust. Well, we all know the American Indians were no pushovers. And I mean, the Tuscarora in North Carolina slaughtered, what, 140 white settlers one day, and uh, men, women, and children. And so they were no saints. They weren't the noble savages. Yet I do believe when we came over here, you know, there was 100 and, or, excuse me, maybe 1 to 1.5 million American Indians in North America. Before we were done with them, there was 40,000. Uh, we gave them disease blankets at times. They fought us well. They slaughtered us. We slaughtered them. We fought them from 1650 to 1920. So it's obvious that they were an amazing uh, opponent for us. And I have some respect for the American Indian, despite uh, some of the brutality of certain of the tribes. So that's considered a Holocaust. We've been talking about uh, Michelle Renew, for instance, and she went to Dresden to simply talk about the Dresden Holocaust and recite some facts and nothing but facts did she say without hatred there. And she was arrested before the end of her presentation in Germany at a commemoration just to commemorate the victims of the Dresden Holocaust. And that was a Holocaust. Of course, we defined what a Holocaust is early on. A Holocaust is from the Greek right hollow and costus. It's a burnt offering. And that would mean that the priest would offer a, uh, uh, a sacrifice, usually of an animal. Uh, we were having a debate about that. I'm not quite an expert on that either. But generally, the hide would be taken by the priest, and it would be burned in its hole, uh, meaning it would be wholly burned so that nothing but ashes was left, and the scent of the burning, a burnt offering would waft up to God, and he'd be happy. So really, a real holocaust means you've got to be dying by fire. And basically, your entire body has to be burned up. And so there are a few instances in history of actual Holocaust. They're rare. I think it's why in the claims about the Jewish Holocaust, it was so important to introduce the idea of the crematory ovens. We've kind of expanded our definition of Holocaust uh, to... And by the way, the Webster's now says, I think it's mass slaughter. That's the first definition. The first, the second definition of Holocaust is, the, actually it's the new Oxford Dictionary, is the slaughter of uh, the six million Jews during World War II. So that, that word has been appropriated. Holocaust has been appropriated. We can't use that anymore. It's kind of like the word gay. I wouldn't say you were gay even if you were happy, but maybe 25 years ago I might have said so. So certain words change their meaning over time, and so one of them is the Holocaust. That being said, we believe that any mass slaughter of innocent civilians is a holocaust. We not only discussed some of the forgotten holocausts, the holocaust in Ukraine in the 1920s, where the kulaks, the productive farmers, were, uh, uh, their crops were taken and they died in some numbers like six to nine million. And if you picked up a seed, I understand, off the ground to give to your child, you could, it was a death offense. Okay, very few people know about that Holocaust. We ought to have that Holocaust Memorial Museum somewhere. Very few people realize the number of um, Southerners who died and the number of Southern civilians, not just soldiers who died. And really what Sherman did in many respects was a Holocaust. We had a small example of a, just a minor one. Nobody hears about those poor workers. The, the ladies at the textile factory, right, were taken out of the, the factory and just but because they were making uh, 
uh, I guess the materials for uh, Southern uniforms and for the military, and they were just lifted up by Sherman and dumped off in what St. Louis and never seen again. A minor, tiny little Holocaust, but indicative of what happened across the South. Uh, the civilians generally have a hard time protecting themselves against mass numbers of troops that come in there. We talked, as I said, about the Dresden Holocaust. We talked about the American Indian Holocaust. We talked about the people behind the Bolshevik Holocaust. We actually talked about, as I said, the Hitler's experiences in World War I and how they affected him and what he saw, and that was a Holocaust. Um, we talked about the allegations against the Einsatzgruppen, and, and this was about the Jewish Holocaust and whether or not the claims and evidence introduced at that particular trial could hold up to factual scrutiny. We talked about the Babi Yar Holocaust, which was the uh, shooting and the massacre of 40,000 uh, almost com all Jewish people thrown into the Babi Yar ravine. One of the most gripping stories in this particular um, September, October 2018 issue of the Barnes Review was one submitted by an excellent writer named Tom Goodrich. I don't know if you got a chance to read that. It was about the real live Holocaust of Tokyo. So if you're going to be burning people into ashes, this qualifies as one of the worst Holocausts in history. I had to read uh, that article over about four pieces because I would read a few paragraphs and it was just so horrific, the detail that he was writing. It's like I had to walk away from it and then I'd come back to it and it, and it took me probably about three hours to make it through that article, just reading a little bit and coming back to it. Possibly it, it should have been my lead article, but we'll talk about the lead article. That's a little more uplifting. You know, uh, but people always told me, don't ever put this stuff in one issue. No one's going to be able to get through it. This is an expanded issue of the Barnes Review, which is normally 80 pages. This is 130. It's perfect bound. And they said they'll never be able to read it all. 60 to 100 million killed in China under Mao. Uh, half the population killed in Cambodia, which I think was about three out of six million. 60, to, 60 million, according to Zolzhenitsyn, people killed in the Soviet Union uh, over a period of time. The people in, Ru in Russia were pretty much killed by the Bolsheviks because they were Christians. We also talk about a couple of other holocausts, too. But anyway, I think it's an interesting thing. Uh, the, the comment that you made about that particular Tokyo article, uh, I had my proofreader say the same thing to me. She had to stop and she had to go call somebody and talk to them about it because this is something that's just totally suppressed. And, and war is a horrible thing. And if the American public knew what our military was doing in our name, we, uh, they would probably, probably be out there marching against war instead of marching against cops killing people, unarmed people, or whatever it is that amounts to small amounts of people. Of course, there's a Holocaust happening in Chicago. There's a Holocaust happening across this country, and young black men shooting each other in untold numbers for no good reason besides profit, I guess, related to the drug trade. The reason Tom's story was so gripping is he collected so many eyewitness accounts of poor women who were running with their family and all of a sudden out of the sky came this globs of napalm and phosphorus and it can't be put out and they would go up like human torches. The same thing happened in Dresden and Hamburg and other World War II cities where it was nothing but helpless, really helpless civilians who were targeted in, in, in such a horrific way. Of course, there was an instance in one of the, uh, the Tokyo article where uh, I think a mom or dad was running with the baby, and the baby was on fire on their back, and they couldn't do anything about it. They tried to get the flame off it, but that, that napalm stuff won't come off, and they went up like a torch, and the number of people who were slaughtered in such a way was hor horrendous. And, of course, when you light a city on fire, especially a wooden, fi a wooden city like much of Tokyo was, there's such a, the, almost a climatic change in that its own weather system happens and the, and the oxygen is sucked away and the heat is horrible. So anybody who survived that was lucky. Of course, the Japanese that I've seen, and I could be completely wrong, aren't begging for reparations, nor are they uh, want the television programs about it. And so I, I just, and what's the real purpose? The real purpose is to diminish the, the, the suffering of the Jews in World War II. It is not. It's more... Uh, to explain to people that man has been slaughtering each other, one another, since the earliest times. It's what we do. I, I'm hoping that one day we can we can advance beyond this solution. War itself ought to be uh, outlawed, uh, but it's not. And war itself should be a war crime, but it's not. All we do is talk about regime change in Iran and how we're going to bring it about, how we're going to attack Venezuela if we have to to get rid of this Maduro, and we're going to send in troops and shoot and kill and drone people to death. I mean, guys go over to Iraq now, and the drone operators will stick a flag 
in the drone. Roll it up. Put your name on it. Bring it back. When it comes back, the bombs are gone, and they hand you this, and here's your flag with your name on it, and we killed two guys. We're not sure if they were guilty of anything necessarily. <laughs> we think they might be, but hang it on your wall pr proudly because of extrajudicial execution. In general, I just want everybody to know that I don't think there's a single ethnic group that hasn't been slaughtered in great numbers, as I say in my editorial, I believe. I think from every continent, maybe except Antarctica, and the tiniest little speck of island, Easter Island, for instance, out in the middle of the, I wouldn't say the middle, but off the coast of Chile, has had its own holocaust in its own way, certain percentage of the population being slaughtered by the other. We didn't mention a lot of holocausts in here. The Armenian Holocaust, the Cambodian Holocaust I've mentioned, but it wasn't mentioned in the article, the Greek Holocaust by the Turks, the Assyrian Holocaust by the Turks. There's many, many more. But I think this gives you a good idea of some of the ones that your kids aren't being taught about in school. And that's why the name of this issue on the front is the Holocausts and Real and Imagined. So anyway, that was kind of the whole thing behind it and how we assembled this. Uh, had we had more, we, and just to get what we have in here, we had to double the number of pages practically. And it could have been, it could have been thousands of pages long. Wrap up with... Uh, uh, a little pictorial, try to uh, try to lighten it up a little bit, but it's really not. It's kind of a depressing but very effective issue. I, again, several people have commented it was one of the the most emotional issues of the Barnes Review they'd ever read, and you're seconding that kind of is the cultural Holocaust that's going on in Europe. I mean, uh, people are forwarding around pictures of Paris and what's going on there with these forced immigration uh, from multiple countries, multiple races, multiple religions, and this just dumping them off by the million in these countries in Europe is completely changing our culture. And I think that slaughtering a culture is as bad as anything else and forcing people to change their ways, the ways that have been in place for thousands of years and creating some of the grandest architecture and artworks the world has ever seen and now we have groups of immigrants sitting on Sacre Coeur or the steps of Notre Dame and urinating on it, for gosh sakes. I would consider that a Holocaust. So yes, I did apply a slightly liberal definition of the word Holocaust. But to me, Holocaust is destruction of something in its entirety. And this is what has happened. This is what has happened since the earliest times of you know, human beings. And it's time we realize that and work against it. Got to stand up and admit that we're violent, vindictive, greedy, and also redeemable. I would like to mention your story. We, we did have a lead story because North Korea is so much in the news. Well, let's go ahead and pause here. We'll have a brief commercial for the Barnes Review and we'll come back in 60 seconds and talk about the Kim Jong-un article. If you love listening to the Dixie Heritage Hour, then I know that you'll love reading the Barnes Review. The Barnes Review is one of my favorite magazines. I began reading the Barnes Review long before they became a sponsor here on the program. In the Barnes Review, you will read Vignettes of Man, from the prehistoric to the very recent, from forgotten races and civilizations to first-person accounts of World War II and the late Cold War. There's just not a more interesting magazine published today, nor a more significant and important subject than real history. So if you'll visit www.barnesreview.org, that's www.barnesreview.org, you can find out how you too can become a subscriber to the Barnes Review. You can subscribe to receive the Barnes Review by mail, or you can subscribe to receive the Barnes Review electronically in PDF editions. Or you can subscribe to receive both. That's what I do. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. We've heard so much about Kim Jong-un being a, and his father and grandfather being brutal killers and insane. We agreed that you would do an, a, a, an excellent article, by the way, you did, on the short history of Korea and why the people of Korea, North Korea, uh, accept him as their legitimate leader. You know, basically, the, the, the House of Kim or the, the royal family uh, from which Kim is descended, that they can date their, their lineage back to the governorship of Korea back for 2,600 years. Obviously, there were at least some in Korea that, you know, they didn't want Western powers telling them who their leadership was going to be. Just as before World War II, they didn't want the Japanese telling them who their leadership was going to be. And so they see uh, they see the House of Kim as a legitimate modern-day 
expression of the royal house of antiquity. One thing that I noticed um, was in your editorial, you had drawn attention to some things. In my article, I simply said that I wasn't validating them and I wasn't denying them. Because the truth is, is that I, I don't know the claim that Kim Jong-un uh, had torched his uncle with a flamethrower. Maybe he did. But, but part of me thinks that that is so brutal. I, mean, I just can't imagine somebody being that evil. Maybe he is that evil. I, I don't know. But some of these things, you know, I read the reports and I don't necessarily believe them because they're just, I can't wrap my mind around them. I, I think you have a point there. Um, I checked into that first before I said it. But, but you are correct that some of the w most wildest claims about our brutality as a species or as human beings, when you hear these claims that someone's done this, you really need to think twice because the natural inclination, even of the worst human being, is to be appalled themselves with outrageous, tortuous acts of violence. However, I always say that leaders of countries, the best ones and the worst ones, usually have a lust for women, power, money. And if this comes with an, an accelerated or accentuated emotional uh, or uh, whatever whatever leadership qualities you, you have, that it's not beyond the pale. Uh, people, leaders of countries in desperate times sometimes make desperate decisions. Now, why Kim Jong-un would do that, or we would believe it, I'm not sure. But according to some of the sources, they were relatively reliable on both the left and right. Kim has done some crazy stuff. I mean, his people have been starving, is that correct? We think. For years, and part of his development of his nuclear program was to try to have a bargaining chip to make life better for them. You look at the industriousness of the South Koreans. Now, I don't know whether or not the geography is completely different, or the climate, or the, but I doubt the people themselves are much different between North and South. And, and you see how successful the South has been, and how uh, it, uh, well. I, I think it's true that they haven't pr been able to produce enough food uh, to feed themselves. But well, that North said, and South Korea, imagine, if you will, the Dakotas or Nebraska. And obviously, uh, the agricultural capacity of Nebraska is a little bit better than the Dakotas because it's a little warmer. Sure. Looking at the industriousness and intelligence of the people on that peninsula, and the fact that just north of Korea to the left, right, is still Peking, and north of that is, well, Siberia. So obviously you have a point that the Siberians could be expected to to feed the rest of Russia. But I do believe that in their location, and they could have probably found another way to, um, to do this than besides uh, the way they've done it. However, look, can't argue with what he's, what he's accomplished. This guy took over at age 27, and he has put them on the map. They've they talk about intelligence and industriousness. They've developed not only ballistic missiles, but nuclear capability. That's something to be said with considering all the embargoes and, and uh, international attention that's been put on them. And that's how he decided to do it. And he's got the United States extremely interested, which is why we kind of wrote this article, right? In that Donald Trump had just gotten over there or had met him, what, in uh, Singapore, I can't remember, and made a deal with him. Well, here's a tiny little country who can't, allegedly cannot feed itself with a psychotic leader who has the United States agreeing to meet one-on-one. -on -one. That's a pretty amazing accomplishment. So we think there's probably a little more to the story, yes, than meets the eye. And even, you know, I point out that if you go back four generations from Kim, you go to his great-grandfather. At that time in the early 20th century, Korea was basically a protectorate of Japan. The Korean royal family had been deposed. The Japanese were governing Korea and there, and there were independence movements in Korea, and it was Kim's great-grandfather who actually was a leader in one of the movements that had actually signed a declaration of independence for Korea. It was short-lived. He had to flee to China, and that's where the Marxist influence came into Kim's grandfather, who became the first leader of North Korea. My point being is that for four generations, this family has governed Korea, and for the first Two of those four generations, their goal was to free Korea from Japanese, we'll call it dictatorship, but you know, from Jap Japanese domination, Japanese occupation, whatever the correct word would be. But this is a family that has systematically been taking Korea. Kim coming to power was not an accident, or even Kim's grandfather 
being the founding, whatever you want to call him, of North Korea was not an accident. Th this goes back at least four generations, and and these are very intelligent men who, who if they weren't intelligent men, and if they weren't uh, politically savvy, if you will, uh, a guy like Kim wouldn't be in power today, given the just the overwhelming uh, hatred of much stronger nations towards his. Well, I mean, even Trump admitted when he came back here that, I think the quote was, his people love him. Yep. And I think they love him for the very reason you said, that it ties them back to their glorious past. I mean, Korea had some great moments, even during its occupation. Um, so, yeah, I, I would I would find that if I were North Korean, that I would be looking and looking at my country. If, in fact, we were having trouble feeding ourselves and our economy was in shambles and the world hated us, I'd say, look, man, we're still great. We have had great times in the history of our nation, and um, this guy is that thread that takes us that takes us to it. Yeah, they, Korea has been overrun. I mean, multiple times. Look at the look at the very fact. I imagine the, 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 every square inch of North Korea was bombed during the Korean War. Yet, and so what would you expect? You can think about that. It's only fifty years ago, sixty years ago, right. and here they've gone. And that's sixty years. I mean, maybe take it back further, as you say, to World War Two, with the, the Japanese, which had a reputation as brutal overlords, and take what happened to them next, and the Korean War, and then this ostracization by the world. And yet they still stand at the spot where a U.S. president is willing to fly six thousand miles to go meet one on one with a man who's allegedly insane. So, yeah, the mainstream media and even history, our history books, of course, written by mainstream leftists, uh, academicians, uh, is, is not telling us the whole story about what's going on there. You might find that North Korea is a massive success story in its own way. Well, the question it, that it begs, at least in my mind, and I know I'm getting a little bit off topic, but just by way of comparison, Cuba is a similar story. You know, when, when, what would have happened with our relations with Cuba had the United States embraced Castro rather than castigating him, forcing him basically to to get what help he could from the Soviets, it's the same thing with Korea. What if the United States would have, which was in total control of of, the, of Japan at that time after World War II, what if the United States would have actually sought an alliance with Kim rather than basically trying to set up a puppet government in opposition to him? You know, not only would that country perhaps not have had a civil war, Korea would not have been nearly as dependent on the Soviets for several decades, and we could have a totally different relationship with uh, with that part of the world right now. We may. It's difficult if even for, uh, say, a group like the Barnes Review who is open to uh, relations with any country, because I think you need to talk to your enemies as well as your friends, and you need to uh, use diplomacy and not war. But it is difficult to wholeheartedly embrace a leftist communist country because of the legacy of death and destruction they've left behind everywhere they've been. Of course, uh, philosophers or uh, historians will say that communism in its purest form has never even been tried. It's a, it's a bunch of baloney. It's been tried. We've seen what has happened in, uh, in the Soviet wow. Union. Uh, and so wow. yeah, that would have been a hard sell. But sure, I agree with you. Uh, oh, go, go, go. George Washington would have said, trade with them, profit with them, uh, help them along, uh, build relationships with them, but you don't necessarily have to have a super special relationship with them. I know one thing that, that kind of saddened me as I, as I researched Korea was Kim's great-grandfather, what started as a Christian nationalist movement by the second generation had become a Marxist communist movement. I think that that could have been avoided in Cuba. I, I believe that had we... Had we reached out to Castro, he had definitely reached out to us at the conclusion of the revolution. Uh, I don't believe that Castro would have ever gone to the Soviets for help, and that that could have been a crisis and a communism totally averted. You know, in Korea, I don't know that we could have ever prevented Kim's government from being Marxist or communist because of the time he had spent in the Soviet army and so forth. And, and you know, that that was kind of even the conclusion of my article that I was hoping that you know Kim being. At, Kim Jong-un, the current leader of Korea, being governed, or rather being educated in Europe and reaching out to the West as he is, that maybe somewhere in all of that he'll be able to reclaim at least some of that Christian nationalism of his great-grandfather and, and, and doing so move away from the Marxist communism of his grandfather. Well, you know, the vilification of Kim family, Kim family, and Kim Jong-un in particular, he just reminds you, right, of... of of the vilification of Syria's al-Assad, who 
is an Alawite, and uh, which is a, a form of Islam that's they get they get along quite well with Christians, and they share some of the Christian saints, and et cetera, et cetera. But <laughs> with the death and destruction we've wreaked in the Middle East upon the Syrians, in particular, in this case, how could we ever admit that Bashar al-Assad is anything but the evil uh, mastermind of mass slaughter? So, like, once the United States government has taken a position, i.e., Hitler was the worst thing in the world that ever happened, the Japanese people were evil, diabolical people, they never back off on it. And they go on it with it forever, because otherwise they'd have to admit they were wrong. And maybe they would admit that by admitting they were wrong, they might admit that had they been put up in a Nuremberg-style trial, we would have been the ones who had been, uh, our generals would have been uh, being hung on scaffolds. That's one thing about it is be nice if, and, and you know, one thing I like about Trump is, I don't, uh, I don't know whether or not uh, he's commented particularly about this. I just thought what he said about <laughs> Kim and Vladimir Putin, for instance, right, is that, hey, they're not quite as bad as what we've heard, and they're people that deserve to be talked to, and we deserve to talk about having peace. So he seems to have divested himself of this policy that the United States government has, then it can never admit that it was ever wrong about anybody or anything, because the history books would have to be rewritten, or maybe reparations might have to be beat be paid, we'd have to admit that we're not the uh, exceptional, right, the exceptional nation that's never wrong, that's out for the moral good of the world forever and ever and ever and ever. So who knows? But I do see parallels between the uh, our vilification of, say, Assad and Gaddafi and Hussein and Kim. Listen, nobody's perfect, right? And the fact that at least we're working towards a solution here. Maybe it's because North Korea has got um, you know, two very powerful, I don't know if they're allies particularly, but two very powerful neighbors that we just can't go be bombing them. But let's say that North Korea was located off in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the Pacific. Well, would we have already bombed these people into smithereens simply because they disagreed with us because they have a different way of going about it? I don't know. Well, you know, Donald Trump talks about, you know, he, he, he implied several months ago, even before he met with Kim, that his red button is bigger than Kim's red button. <laughs> and, and, and that might be true, but the reason why I don't believe that Trump would ever use it, and the same reason why I don't believe that Kim will ever use his, is exactly what you just said. Uh, if Kim were to bomb South Korea, the fallout would come into his own country. If uh, they're, they're too close together, and it's too small of a peninsula. Right. And, it, and if the United States were to nuke uh, North Korea... Like you said, the fallout not only would hit China and Russia, which would put us at odds with two large superpowers, the fallout would also devastate Japan, who was an ally, and South Korea, who is an ally. Yeah, I just don't see a nuclear war happening in that part of the world. You're probably right. Uh, I know that the, the very idea that we, that our leaders even discuss the use of nuclear weapons is, is ridiculous. We have a small article or a, or a cat picture caption we discuss the dropping of the nuclear weapons on Japan. It seems like they were pretty much defenseless cities. Uh, some U.S. servicemen who have subscribed to the publication have said we needed to drop these weapons because we were going to lose a million guys invading Japan. I always say there's a way around it. But anybody who even would consider using a nuclear weapon is nuts. Um, I understand the Russians developed, allegedly, a torpedo-like nuclear weapon, right, that can, that can uh, be uh, a go, go supersonic, I think, and can we bypass all of our defense systems and we can blow, they can blow it off and create a tidal wave of massive proportions off the coast of New York. Well, I mean, even talking about this stuff um, is just absolutely ridiculous. We've got to figure out a way to solve our problems besides dropping nuclear weapons. We saw what happened in poor old Japan. And looking at the cities and the devastation, talk about a firebombing uh, of Tokyo. You're talking about 150,000 people incinerated total in mere minutes in uh Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and then thousands and tens of thousands more. That's a that's another Holocaust. I want to move on in our discussion to uh, the other Holocausts that were discussed in the upcoming issue of the Barnes Review magazine, September October issue of the Barnes Review. But before we do that, uh, we need to have a brief commercial for the American Free Press. If you're like me, and I'll bet you are because you're listening to the Dixie Heritage Hour, you like to be on the cutting edge of honest news and accurate information. You like to hear about the latest financial trends and to know what's happening around the world and right here in the United States. 
the things that can directly impact you, your life, and the life of your family. And if you're like me, you do not rely on the mainstream media to obtain this information because, frankly, you know that you just can't trust them. Fortunately, there is an alternative news outlet with a long-established track record for honesty and integrity, and that is the American Free Press. AFP is the preeminent alternative independent news source for honest, hard-working, truth-loving Americans. AFP is the antithesis of the controlled, lamestream media. AFP is employee-owned and has been so since its founding. Because of that, AFP never has and never will allow advertisers or special interests or big money to dictate what appears in the pages of the American Free Press newspaper. 26 times a year, the American Free Press newspaper can be delivered to your door packed with the kind of uncensored news that I know you're going to appreciate. AFP covers the stories and tells the truth that the lamestream media is frankly scared to touch. And AFP offers real, on-the-scene reporting and commentary, the likes of which you will never see in the Washington Post, the New York Times, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, or just about any other lamestream news source that you can think of. That's right. There's only one national populist news weekly staffed by an unsurpassed team of veteran investigative journalists who will dare to rip the veil off of many of the major news stories that are being censored and suppressed, and that's the American Free Press. AFP publishes exciting, in-depth, uncensored news and information that's grassroots and patriotic, information that Americans need to know in order to combat the growing police state. AFP stands firmly against the New World Order, and against those who are working to establish a global plantation under the rule of a powerful few. In short, AFP is your voice. If you have any doubt why they want to silence AFP, you must be relying on the lamestream media for your news. And folks, that's a big mistake. If you're ever dissatisfied with your subscription to the American Free Press, their guarantee is that you just drop them an email and they will gladly refund the unused portion of your subscription. So what are you waiting for? Visit www.americanfreepress.net. Once again, www.americanfreepress.net. We're back with our guest, Paul Angel, the editor-in-chief of the Barnes Review, and we're discussing the September-October issue of the Barnes Review magazine, the expanded edition on holocausts. And, of course, as we were researching these holocausts throughout history, especially those that took place in Europe during the time of World War II. We not only, of course, uh, uncovered Nazi war crimes, of course, uh, those have been well documented and well illustrated, well broadcast, well advertised, well written about, well put on television and so forth for the last 60 years. But we also uncovered a lot of allied war crimes, crimes that were committed by the soldiers of the Soviet Union of Great Britain and even of the United States against the peoples of Germany and against the peoples of other countries in Eastern Europe and so forth. The powers that be in the European Union and even in Germany, uh, they did not want us uncovering the Holocaust of their own people. You would think that the German government would be glad that somebody would finally be bringing to the attention of the world the horrendous evil, the horrendous toil and suffering that the Allies imposed upon the German civilians at the end of World War II and in the closing days of World War II and then in the aftermath of World War II. And there were hundreds of thousands and even millions who were slaughtered by the Allies, civilians, women, children. I'm not talking about warfare made on soldiers. I'm talking about war that was intentionally made against civilians to maximize civilian casualties. And it was just horrible. It was just, just unconscionable. And yet our reporters and our journalists and our editors in Europe being arrested for doing nothing more than trying to uncover uh, the facts of these allied war crimes. And uh, so, Paul, tell us about that. Some of the writers for this publication have been locked up in Germany, have been locked up across the world. The, the lady who wrote the Dresden article uh, tells us of her of being locked up for making comments, uh, I'm quoting, I think it was Hyam Weizmann, about um, deaths or something, it probably wasn't Dresden, it may have been. The news media isn't going to ever tell you this stuff. 
May it's not part of the narrative. Uh, as far as our, our editor that's that was uh, imprisoned there in Germany, at her memorial for the Dresden Holocaust, uh, she was speaking there, giving a memorial speech. Um, is she still in jail right now, or is she out on some kind of bail, or do you know? Or She has to return to Germany. To, she requested. You could, easily, you, you could pay the fine, I believe, and not show back up for a trial. And I believe she chose to show up in person for her trial, which is a real risk. Because we know she can get locked up, and she can get locked up for years. There's thousands, thousands of people locked up in Germany now, and probably Austria and France, and you know, I know poor old Robert Forrestan keeps getting stuck with it. Fred Tobin got locked up for a bit while he was over there in England. So these countries don't want you talking about these subjects. This is why everybody needs to read the Barnes Review while they can, because one day it'll be illegal in this country, and that's the way we're moving. Uh, but anyway, uh, she will, I think, appear b back in Germany for that trial, and she's facing a pretty heavy fine and possible prison sentence simply for uttering a few truthful comments at a memorial service for the people killed in Dresden, which some people say approaches three hundred fifty to 400,000. I think it probably may have been more like 253. Still a massive thing. That was only Dresden. Forget about Hamburg and Rotterdam and all the other, well, not Rotterdam, uh, one of the other, a couple of the other German cities that were m more than one, I imagine. Cologne, I think. Well, you know what she was pointing out? <clears throat> bombing the Allied bombing of Dresden and other German cities, that they were intentionally targeting civilians. That, that they weren't striking military targets. They were intentionally targeting civilians, seeking a maximum number of civilian casualties against the Germans, and that that in itself was a war crime. You know, one of the things we point out, I guess, in this issue of the Barnes Review is especially as the war continued on and the Allies were certain that they were going to win this war, of course, the winner doesn't have to worry about being tried with war crimes, and so the Allies started uh, striking civilians and essentially committing war crimes with impunity because they had already determined that they were going to win the war and they weren't going to be the ones found guilty of the war crimes. Well, you got to ask yourself, I mean, why slaughter 300,000 mm -hmm. refugees in this ancient city unless you're goal was just to destroy the spirit of these people to the point where they won't resist. But you know what? I mean, old women and old men can't really pick up guns and fight anyway. So it is a psychological thing just to just, just to, to terrorize the populace. Um, and in Tokyo, why? Why? Why were you, were you killing hundreds of thousands of people in such a gruesome fashion? Were they going, were, you, were they going to Pick up arms against your invading troops? Well, possibly, but doubtful they're going to do much good. It's just a, it's just a terrorization to make the, the government succumb at this point. But the thing, there's a difference. The Japanese had rejected, or I guess their emperor had rejected, right, uh, uh, an unconditional surrender. I mean, Hitler had offered peace offers 30 times during the war to stop this. He had tried to, to make an agreement with Churchill, I believe, or with England, uh, not to, 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 to not to target civilians. I mean, there was there's got to be some rules for war, and this well, is what Hitler we had. had agreements. I'm going to assume with both Neville Chamberlain and was it King Edward? And basically, they forced King Edward to abdicate, and Churchill replaced Neville Chamberlain just to force a war with Germany. Again, yes, I'm sure. Uh, it's, I don't know specifically, but. but Again, someone more familiar with this material than I might be able to back up what you're saying, or perhaps you know it. But the point is that, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Allies, the crimes they committed, by the way, the Germans did retaliate, the bombing of Coventry was a, a bad thing. He didn't want to do it, I don't think. And really, because he was a more humane, I guess, <laughs> I get myself in trouble, more humane than any of the Western leaders. And so you just have to ask yourself, what the heck? Who is driving this? What type of insanity would have led these leaders to have targeted? And if they would have read this article, would these psychopaths have changed their mind before doing it? Especially the one by Tom Goodrich on Tokyo. It's just an article you maybe have to read in bits and pieces, like you said. So yeah, man, I mean, it, were things reversed and had the Axis won World War II, I am absolutely sure that every American general they could have gotten their hands on have been strung up in a gallows for what they did in Dresden, Hamburg, Tokyo, and the other 66 or 67 more cities of just purposely attacking civilians. This is why when people talk, they, if you don't know this,
If children are taught this, then they think that only people that get into trouble during war and get locked up in concentration camps and, and die of starvation or are picked up off their property and lose their property are people that we don't like religiously or ethnically, right? That, that, but this is everybody. Everybody, there was Christians in, uh, Christian Japanese, remember the, 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 was it the Hiroshima, the Nagasaki, and the Nagasaki bomb was blown off above that big cathedral. Well, it was in prayer services, church services, and Christian cathedral, lots of Christians in Nagasaki. So they weren't just targeted because they were Japanese necessarily. Maybe they were targeted because they were Christian. I don't know. The fact of the matter, they were innocent civilians. That's what they all kept in had in common, and they were Japanese. You know, if you don't know this, then you think that we're always so moral. You know, the United States would never do something like that. No, the United States could never do it. Our leadership couldn't be so evil. And once you start to realize that the United States has made a lot of very poor decisions over the years committed its own share of Holocaust. I don't think you wander into somebody else's country with such a snotty pride that you have a moral superiority against, say, the Japanese, who also fought a very brutal war, as we know, with our prisoners, and I think that is true. And they were just a different culturally, uh, as far as what they could take pain-wise and what they would inflict and what an enemy expected to get, et cetera, et cetera. And they were also, you know, revengeful. Not quite as vengeful as the Allies were of the Germans after World War II, the mass expulsions and the killing of three million POWs. But I just think that, you know, this is what, it makes me want to question my government. Are you telling me the truth about the chemical attacks, chemical attacks in Syria? Are you telling me the truth about Vladimir Putin? Are you telling me the truth about Kim Jong-un? And then when you start to learn, you realize that, of course, they're not telling you the truth. They've got an agenda. And their agenda isn't going to work if large numbers of Americans know the truth about these things and start to ask questions. Uh, we say, uh, was it Thomas Jefferson, but it was somebody else I just read recently, <clears throat> Madison or somebody who said, man, it's our moral obligation to question every single um, decision of the president of the government of the United States. It's, it's, it's the height of patriotism to question whether or not we should be uh, supporting ISIS. <laughs> of course, they don't really tell you that in the news either. Or whether or not we should be of uh, considering, talking about who's got the bigger nuclear button. It's absolutely ridiculous. I just don't understand it. Well, Maybe it's business interests, but why we can't figure out a better way in this country, of all countries, the, one of the greatest countries in the history of this planet, to solve our problems in, in, a, in a better way than start talking about slaughter people. And you know this, and then you get your spot, and you can wrap us up if you like. But if you drop a nuclear bomb, that's just the fallout, man. It's hundreds of thousands of people, and you know that most of them are going to be innocent, women, children, elderly people. It's just unconscionable that any American could hear this type of rhetoric and not raise their hand and say, can I ask a question? Are you going to kill tens of thousands, millions of innocent people? I'm out. I'm not for that. We're out of this thing. Well, the whole house of cards start to fall right about then. But anyway, go ahead. Well, you know... Uh, toward the end of the issue, of course, the last issue was the cultural holocaust of Europe that's currently happening. But be just before that, there were two articles, essentially Lincoln's holocaust, the North's holocaust against the South during the war between the states. And if you think about it, Lincoln literally committed a holocaust, war crimes, the, the just the barbaric slaughter of his own people. His own nation, essentially. <clears throat> if it was okay under President Lincoln for us to slaughter our own and commit war crimes against our own and engage in what's called total warfare against our own, and by the way, the concept of total warfare really didn't exist in the Western world until Abraham Lincoln authorized it against the South. But if it became okay to, to just totally abandon the rules of civilized warfare... And, and act as barbarians towards our own people, as Lincoln made that acceptable, well, then certainly a generation later we could go over to Europe and, and be barbarians to those people. In, in other words, we, we didn't make the application in the issue of the Barnes Review, but, but I'm basically saying it that it was the war of the North against the South that basically opened up the can of worms that, that made the nuclear holocaust of the Japanese or... The slaughtering of the German POWs at the at the end of the war possible. You're probably 100 percent correct. Uh, we all know that the police state, as such, 
really didn't exist before Lincoln. I mean, I guess it may have. We had some 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 tough leaders, but the idea. I mean, he changed it. He is the father of modern day police and uh, police state, and the police state has no regard for its own citizens. That is. That is the truth, and that's probably where it came apart. You're, 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 it, it did change us as a nation, obviously. I, mean, I'm gonna, I, I guess that it just popped in my head just a second ago. It's quite possible our nation lost its soul in 1863. Well, you make a very good point. You know the very fact that, although I imagine other countries have had civil wars and survived and not lost their humanity as we did, although we developed so many so many more weapons during that war to slaughter ourselves faster, <laughs> each other faster and more efficiently, you know. But I've always thought that, you know, I always thought that it was easy for us to kill Muslims because Muslims are a little, have a little bit darker skin and they're a little bit different religion. Okay, well, the American people would support that or support killing North Koreans because they're, they have, uh, they're, they look mongoloid, right, and and they have a problem, but maybe a religion that's different, we don't really know. And I always thought that if we had something in common, we would have a hard time slaughtering each other. But we were slaughtering our fellow white Christians in Moss in the Civil War, so a very good point. Too bad we didn't have more war photographers at the time. You had a couple of them going on, or they were willing to show the, the carnage. I mean, every family lost somebody in the Civil War, and there's still nobody stood up. Did we have mass anti-war rallies? I know we had anti-draft rallies, right? Uh, or excuse me, protests that broke down into massive riots uh, with uh, hundreds of people getting killed, right? And so there was a big anti-war movement. At least people didn't want to participate in the slaughter anymore. But I imagine this the, the coverage of it was as twisted or slanted as it is now. I mean, I just, I just know this, that getting your news or history from any large corporate outfit is a big mistake. So again... I would hope that if, if we could get enough copies of this issue into people's hands, and they could just read, just let's say, the Tokyo article. There must be 30 articles, 25 articles in this thing of all different types. Like I said, we missed a lot of stuff, but you can't get it all in. That if you could just see what we did, in, for instance, to the Japanese in their own eyes, and how they responded to it, by the way. I mean, what a stoic people. But at very late to, under, to explain to people what happens, everything's so sanitized that maybe the American public would stand up and say the most important issue to them is that we don't go out and slaughter anybody else. So we don't holocaust anybody else. Judging from what I've seen from the people reading the Tokyo article, there's a possibility of that. But what we want to do is get this into as many people's hands as possible. The issue is only 10 bucks for one. I think it's 5 bucks for shipping and handling. When you're talking about an 8.5 by 11 publication, perfect bound, and 130 pages, that's like a 275-page book. That's a big, fat book. That's 10 bucks for a big, fat book. You can't even get that from Walmart and Barnes & Noble. Okay, they, they sell such a thing and they can afford to for 18 to $25. This thing is important. And we're giving you a discount for, for order and extra. It's not a, oh, well, it should be up on the website by the time we conclude this um, interview and the interview is posted. But go to the website. Look up the Holocausts issue, the July, August 28 issue. Go order five or ten of them. It's 50 bucks. Who knows? Maybe, maybe if 10,000 or 30,000 of these issues get into the hands of the American public. They can finally start to stop the reverse, the brainwashing. A, that we've holocausted millions of people across the world. Everybody has, but especially the great Western allies, more so than maybe others. That, that, uh, that communism and Bolshevism have, have holocausted tens, hundreds of millions of people that this new leftist surge in the United States with the Democrats going towards this way with Social Democrat Party, that Antifa isn't really anti-fascist, it's pro-neo-Bolshevik. That this is what was happening, these types of leftist street rallies that people sat by and watched happen were happening in Germany in the 1930s, which let Hitler rise up. These types of things were happening on the streets of, of Russia and the overthrow of the Tsar, the Christian Tsar, that ended up in the slaughter of tens of hundreds of millions of people. Don't underestimate where a little twisted propaganda can lead you. If the American news media is going to be a little more honest about the dangers of this, these neo-Bolsheviks on the streets, we're in for big trouble, especially if you can't get the truth anyplace else. I see a great parallel as to what it, what happened in 1930s Germany and what happened in 19, 18, 1917, 18, 1920, all the way through the 19, the, uh, 19 like fell in 1993, of the dangers of this type of ideology.
Um, but you know what the funny thing is? We can't take the Barnes Review into college campuses. Uh, we're banned, you know, South Carolina particularly. But if we show up there, we're going to be shout down. We're going to be uh, uh, throwing bricks at because we are uh, telling the truth about this little twisted ideology behind this all. Of course, I, I guess at least one of the big movers and shakers is George Soros. This this far leftist radical billionaire who's ruined countries, who through the back door is funding Black Lives Matter and Antifa groups and Media Matters for America and legislation for congressmen to introduce talking about forcing the uh, internet moguls to cut back on uh, or to, to crush free speech and not let a message of a conservative group get out there. I mean, this place is this is a mess. How long we're going to be able to put out an issue like this? I would say I have no idea. But everybody needs to go out and get 5, 10, 15, 20 copies of this thing and hand them out to as many people. And I think it's going to have some effect. Uh, maybe it'll snowball. Maybe this will be our, our big moment, right? You never know. Of course, we'll be vilified for even discussing some of these topics in here. But I think it's an extremely important issue. Other people might say that we're just riding the same old horse. Right, but this horse is taken to. If that horse hadn't lost a race yet, I say keep getting on top of him. The truth is the name of that race horse, and he can win this one, and he can help affect change in this country, and get people up there too. And multiple things. One is the pro-free speech. Start talking about how everybody deserves to have free speech. Number two is to talk about how awful war is. Number three is talking about a monopoly and suffering and stopping that BS. Number four is the untrustworthiness of the media. Number four is you can't trust the U.S. intelligence and the deep state. Read the, the, the MK Ultra Holocaust story. You can't trust a lot of people. But what you can trust is the facts. If you do the research on it and actually look into it, it might be shocking to you that these things have actually happened and you never heard about them in school. But they're never going to tell you about the suffering of other groups and other people, especially in war and how horrible this is. Tell the website, www.barnes, B-A-R-N-E-S, barnesreview.org. The toll-free number is 1-877-773-9077. Money through Thursday. And, and order a copy of this. And while you're at it, go get a copy of that Defending Dixie uh, issue that we did, which was talking about this this cultural cleansing, this holocaust of history that's going on in the South. Poor old Silent Sam got knocked over recently, right? I mean, it, most people don't even know who he is. Even people on that uh, campus don't know that these leftists can turn over, deface, uh, spray graffiti on, spray curse words on, monuments of our heroes in the in the past and the police will say well we'll see if we're going to investigate it come on if this has been a statue of martin luther king they'd have been on this in a heartbeat calling it a, 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 what do they call it a hate crime and had everybody in the cia and the fbi and the NSA trying to track down the perpetrators but because it's just us the poor old southerners they don't give a hoot about it. So that's another issue. I think that's a good one. Both of these are expanded issues. And, uh, yeah, man, we're just going to keep plugging away. So thanks for uh, talking to me about this particular issue. That's all the time that we have for this week's TBR Radio Presents the Dixie Heritage Hour. I always enjoy interviewing my boss, Paul Angel, the editor-in-chief of the Barnes Review, when a new issue of the magazine comes out. And, of course, this is just a power-packed, stuffed, chocked-full of information issue of the Barnes Review. It's probably the biggest issue of the Barnes Review that will be put out this year. In fact, let me just say this. If you only read one magazine this year, and I'm not just saying one magazine from the Barnes Review. If you only read one magazine in the entirety of the year 2018... It probably needs to be this September-October issue of the Barnes Review. So go to the Barnes Review website, www.barnesreview.org. Check it out. And uh, if you don't want to buy the uh, the print issue, then get the PDF issue. I think the PDF issue is like $3 maybe. Uh, it's less than the print issue. It'll still put the information in your hands and also put it in a format that you can share with others. So... Um, so you'll definitely want to do that. And uh, also go to my website, www.dixieheritage.net. And when you're there, sign up for a free copy of my weekly Dixie Heritage newsletter. And also sign up for uh, a copy of my book, The Truth About the Confederate Battle Flag. Basically what will happen is you give me your email address, 
and I send both of them to you absolutely free of charge with no cost, no obligation. And uh, it'll put a lot of truth into your hands, truth that you'll want to share with others. And so, uh, once again, I thank you for being our guest and for joining us for this week's issue of TBR Radio Presents the Dixie Heritage Hour. And I hope that you'll tune in uh, same time, same place next week, and we'll do it again. Until then, God bless. <music>